me, Mike Conlon, uh, from FXCDU. Uh, we're talking uh, trading made simple uh, this morning. And uh, we're talking about trading made simple, but I think uh, anybody who's been in this market the last, uh, say, uh, week or two knows that, well, God, it really hasn't been that simple. <laughs> There's been a lot going on. Uh, we know a lot uh, about what's going on in the news, and we've had uh, a lot of volatility. So, um, you know, there's been some good opportunities, but um, it's been the kind of thing where you need to really adjust, uh, you know, sort of what you're doing as far as uh, trading goes. So let me get the uh, camera up here so we can uh, take a look. All right, there we go. And everybody, can everybody see me? We should be looking at a five-minute chart here, Euro USD. Everyone got this? Can everyone see this chart? All right, excellent. Um, actually, what I want to do is I want to uh, flip over here to gold real quick um, because obviously that's been the uh, the market mover here the last uh, couple of days, and we know about this mass sell-off. And uh, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit more and give you a little bit more clarity on, on sort of what's what I think is happening here. And it's, it's it's been interesting, but you know, I think at the beginning of the week, um, you know, everyone was sort of saying, well, hey, you know what, uh, Bernanke's probably going to set the table here for some sort of uh, Further uh, quantitative easing, QE3 as it's known, and I, you know I don't think anybody's expecting him to come out and just say it right off the bat, but uh, you know there's this expectation that that's what's going to happen, and you know the markets can be uh, a little bit impetulant, you know it's sort of like a, a child when a when a parent just kind of gives into them, just gives them things to keep them quiet, you know all of a sudden when when the parent stops doing that, you know the kid starts to cry again and even a little bit louder, so the market's sort of been in that mode. I think you know for Bernanke it's going to be tough to sort of wean the markets off of. Uh, all the uh, easy money that he's been flowing their way. But, um, you know, so we saw uh, gold came off and it sold here. I just want to look at this on the uh, two-hour chart. So you can see that we got the highs up there uh, just over 1900. I think it was 1912 or 1913 and a quarter, I think, was the official high. All right, we've, we've definitely sold off here on the short term. And if we look at this in the daily, you can see that uh, what was a, a nice little uptrend here is sort of broken down. But, you know, we can also go back and look at this on the weekly trend. And if you look at that, that uptrend still still looks pretty good and intact. I mean, you know, we've had a, a, a one big week sell-off here. All right, this uh, 200 some dollars that it's pulled back is the the biggest two-day sell-off I think since 1980. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously gold's pulling back here. But the question is, is gold done? And I'm not so certain at this point. And uh, sort of here's what's going on. Um, okay, we know about, uh, you know, sentiment now uh, earlier in the week. It sort of changed a little bit. And people said, well, you know what, maybe maybe Bernanke isn't going to uh, go ahead and, and, and set the table for QE3. All right? And what's going to happen if that occurs? Well, that uh, reduces the inflation expectation. If there's no inflation expectation, all right, because there's no uh, uh, hot money chasing goods and services, then perhaps inflation is not going to be a problem. Maybe we don't need to own gold. All right, so we saw gold pulling back and selling off here. I'm just going to go to the four-hour chart real quick. But one of the things that also happened is last night, CME decided to raise the margin requirements for gold. All right, so they've had all this hot money flowing in and out, speculators all over the place, primarily the upside. And uh, they decided, okay, you know what? Gold was down, uh, I don't know, 150-something over the past uh, two days prior to this morning selling. And they said, you know what? Maybe now is a good time to, to raise these margin requirements. Well, you know, it got me thinking a little bit, sort of uh, along the lines of, well, why would they do that after the fact? I mean, gold is sort of selling off, right? Already, it's, it's, it's you know, it's done its own pullback. Why would they, why would they raise those margin requirements? And I think maybe it's because they actually have a fear that perhaps, indeed, Bernanke will say something as far as quantitative easing goes, and that maybe we're going to see a rebound in gold. All right, so looking here in the longer term four hour charts, just got the pivot set up, and you can see that we just landed at this S1. Uh, support area here. All right, but what we have here is I'm looking at S2 as a target area. And if you think about what happened with S2, all right, right at this level right back here, all right, what really started this, this recent breakout way back here, all right, before we got up to that S2 uh, area, which had been resistance at the time before we saw the breakout. And that essentially was the downgrade of uh, the U.S. credit by S&P. All right, that's what caused that big move higher. So, you know, people jumped in. They started thinking, okay, this is a safe, gold's a safe haven asset. All right, but really gold's more of a, of a hedge against inflation. You know, and at that point, I, you know, I don't know if that was necessarily the right tack. But as you can see on the weekly chart, gold's been going up for some time now. So is, is, is gold finished here? Well, I'm not quite sure because, you know what, when I see the, the action that happened at the top, 
I was really expecting more of like that crescendo moment, you know, that blow off top that you see. There's that, you know, that huge spike where, you know, that's the, finally the last moment where, you know, everybody and their brother jumps in before the thing collapses. But if you look at it, okay, yeah, there is selling it, but you just don't see that massive, that massive move up. So possible we could get a bounce here and maybe we sit up above S1 tomorrow, come down and test S2 before bouncing higher. So it's been a lot of interesting market action, and you know the forex market's actually sort of—I don't, I don't want to call it immune—but we haven't been seeing the same volatility that we've been seeing in uh, the equity markets. Now, okay, we can look at this chart and say, "Oh, that looks pretty volatile," <laughs> and it does. It's back and forth a lot. But what you'll notice is that we're just pretty much trading ranges here. All right, 145 in the top. All right, we can even go as low as 141, even though the range has been much tighter, say 143 to 145 on Euro USD. So, you know, basically what I've been doing for the last you know, week or so is just doing some quick scalping here right off the top of the range and at the bottom of the range. And, and that's sort of how, uh, you know, the market activity has been for me over the past week or so. So we can look at, um, you know, we go back a little bit and you can see that, you know, the pivots are in there and those uh, are sort of holding price. We're, we got a, a resistance one there and S1. And we're right in there. So you're right, Harley. It has been very choppy for FX. We can look at, you know, Aussie, same sort of deal. I mean, these things just tend to be right around the pivot. So, you know, this is really one of those times when you have to ask yourself, well, what's going to happen? All right, what, what's what's going to happen tomorrow? What's Bernanke going to do? And that's the million-dollar question everybody's been asking. And, you know, part of it is that as a trader, I'm, I don't want to sit here and try and guess what's going to happen. I mean, you can run through the possible scenarios. But what I'm really thinking about is that once we get into these ranges that, that tend to contract a little bit, and you can see it. We'll go back and look at it here on the euro. But, you know, we can say that the euro range started off at, say, you know, uh, where was I? I was on the one hour, right? Okay, we were saying 141 to 145, and now it's contracted, and we're saying about 143 to 145. So you can see that those ranges are contracting a little bit, and what that sometimes sets up for is what we call coiled spring. All right, so if you think about the way a spring works, right, you get one of these uh, slinky-type deals. All right, you can take the thing, and you can really, really compress it a lot. All right, but what happens when you let go of it? Boom, the thing explodes, and it comes popping out. And I think that's the type of action that the market's setting up for tomorrow. All right, so which way is it going to go? Not really certain. And you know what? The market's not either. I mean, look at how we're just sitting here right on these pivots. So what's somebody to do at this juncture? Well, to be honest with you, not much uh, from a long-term perspective. I'd be looking much more at short-term trading. And, and quite frankly, um, tomorrow, I'm going to have to wait and see what happens. Because, you know, you can sort of treat this event like, uh, you know, I don't want to call it NFT where, uh, you know, the number comes out and then, you know, boom, you get the knee-jerk reaction and then, the actual uh, either opposite uh, action or a continuation, right? But this speech could be the kind of thing where who the heck knows how long he's going to be talking for. And the market's weighing on every word. And, you know, you could just see this kind of uh, crazy volatility happening. So my guess is that we're going to see the ranges expand, all right? And then once it settles, we could get that breakout either one way or the other. Well, okay, which way is it going to go? Well, that's another good question. All right, now, uh, you know, the focus in the markets have been on Bernanke and what he's going to do on Friday. But, you know what, there's a lot of other stuff that's going on in the markets, too. And I think what's happening in Europe is something that's sort of being swept under the rug a little bit as everybody's waiting to hear, oh, what's Bernanke going to do? All right, let's talk about what's happening in Europe real quick. Um, and I think people may have seen this or not, but, uh, you know, because they're sort of, uh, sort of quiet right now about it. But uh, two -year, or, uh, yields on Greek two-year debt are at all-time highs right now up in like the 40% range somewhere, all right? Now, I thought, you know, just recently this Merkel-Sarkozy summit was supposed to have uh, to come out and provided some clarity, and people are saying, okay, this is, uh, you know, this is good. We've got a, an option here. We're going to expand the EFSF, and everyone's going to be happy. Well, not quite so. Um, Norway has been uh, barking recently that they'd like to get some collateral from Greece before they agree uh, to anything. Well, if they get collateral, then someone else is going to ask for collateral. Or maybe other people are scratching their heads saying, yeah, this is a good idea. You know, maybe they should put the Parthenon up as, uh, as collateral. Although I got to tell you, I don't know how you depreciate that over the last couple thousand years, but, um, that seems to be, um, an asset that's perhaps declining. So well, the moral of the story is Greece doesn't have much collateral. And, you know, these guys have to go into it, you know, just backing the full faith credit of the euro and what they're doing. So they actually have to vote on the expansion of the EFSF. I think it's coming out in about two weeks or so. 
and it could be questionable on what happens there, especially if uh, you know people aren't convinced that uh, you know that there's will there to to get it taken care of. And with Greek two year at forty percent, that's 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 a tough pill to swallow. So you know that's an interesting scenario that's going to be out there. So I think maybe the markets were kind of sitting around going, well, you know what, euro is right in the middle of the range here, and this is a decent range for it. All right, and if Bernanke doesn't embark on QE3 or he doesn't say, you know, hey, we were going to do further monetary easing, all right, maybe the dollar actually strengthens. That's the move. Euro tanks. Okay, that would set up uh, sort of in line with sort of the way the fundamentals are going and perhaps the way that the risk should be looked at in the market. I mean, I would love for Bernanke just to get up and say, what, what are you guys talking about? We're just on a fishing trip here out in Jackson Hole. It's beautiful out here. What, what, what do you want me to say? I already told you everything at the last FOMC. You know, but but we've now got this society where everybody's weighing on every single word, and this guy's tinkering and and toying with policy. And you know, thankfully, politicians are on vacation because you know, I I just it's just nice to get a vacation. You know, it's it's great when the politicians say, yeah, we're going to take a vacation. But well, you know what? It's it's they're giving us a vacation from them, and that's actually been a good thing. Uh, you know, one of the things that's sort of a bummer is that uh, we've got this uh, hurricane. Um, coming up here through the East Coast. And we also had a, a earthquake for the first time I can remember um, ever, actually, uh, earlier this week. But, gosh, too bad that hurricane didn't come a little bit earlier and just ruined all those guys' vacations sitting in their nice, fancy beachfront homes. But that's another story for another day. Um, in any event, so what's gonna, what are we doing with the markets here? See, we've just got this market shop going on, and we're back and forth in these ranges. All right, so up until tomorrow, I was looking basically to uh, sell these tops, buy these bottoms. But now, okay, I'm thinking that we could be seeing some sort of breakout potential. And, I mean, you know, if you look at this chart, I mean, this is just a mess on the four-hour. You know, like, what kind of direction are you going to get there? All right, so you look at this here and sort of setting up like a triangle a little bit, perhaps. Uh, let me see here. God, you know what? I, I don't even want to draw this on the daily chart. Let me look at the, the weekly, see if that tells us anything. And right, you can see here on the weekly, we're sort of getting up towards these previous highs that we had. And uh, whoops, there goes the antivirus. Let's get rid of that. Sorry. Um, you sort of see it's like a little bit of a triangle happening there you know I don't know it, it, it's sometimes hard to sit there and, and try and make sense of, of what's happening with these things but uh, right now I mean you can see the chop so that's euro and that's uh, that's been kind of ugly um, let's take a look here at pound real quick we haven't uh, looked at pound yet this morning but you can see pound here starting to move lower right we put in well a little bit of a, a resistance up here 166 Okay, you can see one, two, three, sort of a triple top. We've been pulling back. We're pulling into the S1. All right, we know about uh, the sales figures that came in overnight. CBI sales came in lower than expected, and tomorrow they've got GDP figures. Well, you know, what's been going on over in the U.K. is is that one of the things they've been concerned about, uh, B of E especially, is that, you know, okay, we've got this uh, declining uh, economic growth. We need to keep uh, uh, monetary policy accommodative. In fact, we may need to be more accommodative, despite having inflation that's you know up in the four and a half percent range, which is more than twice their target. Well, what's happened over there? Well, we know about uh, the riots that took place a little while ago, and there's just a general feeling of, of discontent. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with growth. But to be honest with you, you know the pound's sort of been hanging in there, and I don't want to call it a pillar of strength. Okay, but it definitely hasn't been a source of weakness for global markets. So um, that's been an interesting story. So if you guys have any questions about, you know, anything that's going on around the globe or you want to take a look at something, by all means, um, you know, pop it in. But, um, you know, for right now, these trades have just been really, like it was mentioned, very choppy. And uh, it's just kind of interesting on, on where, you know, we think these things are going to go. Now, take a quick look at dollar yen here. Whoops. Dollar yen. Okay, you can see dollar actually strengthened a little bit. We got the uh, the breach of 76 uh, earlier uh, last week, and I think markets are sort of waiting on uh, uh, Bank of Japan to do something about it. Well, I think Bank of Japan's been a little bit hesitant because, again, they don't know what's going to happen with with this Friday's meeting. You know, I mean, the the conventional wisdom, or at least market sentiment, was saying, hey, we're going to hear something about further easing, and all of a sudden people have sort of backed away from that. All right, so you can see the dollar strengthening a little bit here against the yen, but does that mean that, uh, you know, all bets are off tomorrow for Bernanke? No, of course not. All right, and does that mean that the Bank of Japan won't do some intervening? Now, 
They just mentioned, I think it was yesterday, they came out with a new uh, facility, a $100 billion facility for some of their businesses to deal with the, uh, you know, recent yen strength. But it's not an actual, you know, currency intervention or market operations, which are going to cause uh, the yen to weaken. All right? It's just saying, well, no, it's, it's more like, a, you know, I, I didn't see what the exact nature of what their plans are, but it's almost like counseling. Like, well, you know, here, we, we understand your problems. Let's, let, me, let me help talk you through it. All right? So it didn't really impact uh, the market. You can see right here that uh, there was a little bit of a, a, a selling off here after that news was announced and it was uh, sort of ineffectual. So, um, but, you know, who knows? Bank of Japan may not be done, you know? If the dollar can strengthen on its own because maybe Bernanke doesn't ease further and just says, nope, that's it, We're not, you're not getting anything more, then perhaps we see some dollar strength. Well, what's that going to do to the rest of the market? What's that going to do to the correlations? And, you know, we talk a lot about the correlations in the market, but, you know, these things are not 100% and they don't happen all the time and I think there's going to be you know points in time where you know these things start to break down a little bit and you know I think we're going to have to get to a scenario where uh, you know we can see uh, the dollar rise a little bit as well as equities you know um, we don't see it happen very often but you know if we look at S&P 500 here all right let's just pull it down to I don't know five minute chart you can see that there was some major uh, moves this morning. I think this is on uh, uh, Buffett's uh, Bank of America announcement. Okay, you know, uh, sometimes you can say the bottom's in when, when uh, that vulture Buffett comes along and starts scooping up undervalued assets. Um, you know, it would uh, be interesting, uh, you know, the way he jumped into Goldman Sachs during the whole crisis. He, of course, he does it through preferred notes and, you know, buys them at a discount and, you know, all this other stuff, which I guess is one of the reasons why you're the greatest investor ever. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different correlations in the market that we look at that um, haven't really been holding up with the recent stock market volatility we've been seeing. You know, the, uh, the, the uh, currency market, Forex market, has been a little bit quieter. So that's really what it's, it's been looking at, and it's really um, come down to, all right, we're waiting for uh, Bernanke tomorrow, but I think we're definitely going to get that explosion uh, tomorrow, and we're going to see. And I, you know what? I, I think markets are going to be a little bit disappointed, all right? But... That's a good thing, you know. It's, it's kind of like you, you have to wean the markets off of the free money. Otherwise, uh, you, you know, it, it's just the, the problem gets even worse and worse and worse. And, you know, right now there's plenty of cash in the sidelines. All right? People are concerned about the economy. Sure. I'm concerned as well. All right? People are concerned that we're kicking the can down the road and that Washington, D.C. can't get their act together. Sure, I'm concerned as well. But is the world going to end tomorrow? No, of course not. You know, if Bernanke doesn't say free money for all, are, are we all finished? No. You know, listen, these guys are going to do what's necessary, whether it's uh, less than we'd like to see or whether it's required. They'll, they'll do what's necessary to keep society moving. But does that mean that, uh, you know, you want to go out and start uh, planning, you know, three, four, five, ten years down the road? Not based on these numbers. Not at all. All right? But there's going to be ma ways to make money in these markets. All right, and I think stocks is going to be a, a pretty decent way to do it, regardless of what Bernanke says. All right, we may need to get through the initial, you know, swath of selling if it occurs. All right, but there's going to be some opportunities out there. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, we talk about this Apple deal, you know. All right, Steve Jobs is gone. Well, you know, we've seen this before. Steve Jobs is getting a new liver. You know, boom, Apple sells. All right, scoop it up. What happens? Apple goes higher. All right, everyone's got an iPod. Everyone's got an iPad now. All right, there's value out there. And there still is a lot of value out in these markets. All right, the question is, can you find it? Now, let's see. Looking back at some of these other things. So um, I think the tactics that we've been using over the past, uh, uh, say, week or two, this trading the ranges, trying to buy these bottoms and sell near these tops, I think that I don't want to be stepping in front of what's a potential freight train tomorrow um, by doing that. And, you know, a lot of times during market, normal market conditions, you can get away with it, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, Maybe just wait for the breakout to occur and then see if you can get on that, that train. All right. Breaks out to the upside, buy the break. If it starts pulling back, scalp it out and then we'll see if you can buy it back on, uh, uh, you know, a pullback. But, you know, when you think about the tactics involved, you know, it's tough to come in and initiate positions right here because, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, and you can do short term stuff. I mean, you know, what are we looking at here? Euro USD. All right. It looks like Euro's. You know, wants to sell off a little bit. We've got these Bollinger's expanding. We've got this stochastic potentially crossing over. All right, but we're coming into this 144 area support. And how much lower do we think it's going to go here? I mean, can it come back down a little bit lower? Sure. Of course it can. All right, so what are we looking at here? Maybe 
Next pivot area, 143.60. Okay, that's 40 pips in there. That's game. Maybe put the stop up above, uh, say, 144.30, just above the uh, the middle band there on the 20 period moving average on the 15 minute chart. Sure, we can do that. But yeah, I gotta tell you, you know, if if it's just I've tried to be very selective with the entry points that I'm looking for, and haven't been looking to ride momentum here because the chop's been so so great. You know, a lot of times you see that and. You know, I mean, you look at what happened with gold, you know, and I, I, was, I was talking to a guy the other day who wanted to buy it up around 1875 on what he was calling a pullback. I said, a pullback from, you know, well, yeah, it was up as 1913, so this is a pullback. And I said, man, you got to be kidding me. You know, I'm looking at support and resistance levels. I'm looking at it. I'm saying, you know, I think 17, uh, I think it was 1775 was an area where I had support. I'm like, man, that's a ways away. It's not going to get there. And then what happened? It got there the next day in short order. You know, so it's the kind of thing where, you know, you have to really be concerned about momentum and, 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 you know, the trader in you has to really come out because, you know, you can't just look at something like gold and say, oh, gold's going up. I better buy it. You know, it's all about risk adjusted return. All right, sure, I'd love to own gold, but where can I get into it where, you know, there's less risk? Now, obviously, it's been pulling back quite a bit. So you've got all of the, you know, catch the falling knife scenarios that are out there. All right, but listen, gold was... Gold was, you know, right around these levels, all right, prior to this whole, uh, you know, right after the uh, S&P downgrade. So the problems that, you know, we've seen this past month haven't gone away. In fact, they may have even gotten greater with what's going on in Europe, all right? So we talk about areas that we may want to invest, all right? Safe havens could be a, a big area. And when we talk about safe havens, all right, we haven't even mentioned Swiss Franc. And if we look at the Swiss Franc here, you can see, boom, just a little breach of that 115 area. And pulling back down, probably going to pull back to this, uh, uh, this pivot support area on the 15 minute chart. But let's go out a little bit more. All right, you can see that, uh, on the two hour chart, we've got, uh, Euro that had been, you know, boom, it's been up higher versus Swissy. Okay, we know that the Swiss are trying to intervene, keep the currency weak. All right, let's go maybe to the daily chart. I'm sorry, I've got some spaghetti lines drawn on here. Uh, I don't know what I was drawn the other day. Um, but you can see here. All right, that we had uh, uh, Swissy strength, and you know we got down to close to that parity level before bouncing higher. So what's going to happen? All right, well this chart tells us, well hey, maybe we're going to come pop back up here around uh, maybe that 120 level, and that 120 level is an area that has sort of been bandied about by you know the folks talking about uh, the SNB wanting to go ahead and perhaps peg the currency to the euro. Well, if they did that, they'd probably want to do it up at 120. So, you know, when I see all of these different charts, you know, you can kind of go through them. And, you know, a lot of times the charts look similar. All right, or they look opposite, but they sort of support uh, a little bit of the same thesis. But when I look at some of these charts, they're really not supportive of the same thesis, you know. This one here is telling me, hey, Euro can uh, can go a little bit higher here versus Swissy, perhaps. All right, and then we've got the other one, Euro. USD telling me, well, hey, euro could uh, potentially go down here versus dollar. So hard to say exactly, you know, what way to go. But what I'm looking to do is wait for that reaction after the speech tomorrow. All right, let the market settle down for a little bit, and then hopefully a little bit of clarity emerges. But you know, when you, when you have something volatile like this, where it's not just uh, you know, boom, a number hits the tape and that's it. All right, it's really uh, you know, a, a guy sitting out there speaking who, you know, who knows what he's going to say for the first half of the speech. And, you know, something else to consider is that we have U.S. GDP figures coming out prior to the speech tomorrow. And I've sort of been joking around with people. I said, you know what, I bet she's got two copies of that speech. You know, one if the GDP is better than expected, one if the GDP is worse than expected. And, hey, what's the number? Okay, this is the one I'm reading today, and here's what we're going to do. But, you know, to think that these guys are crafting their words in such a way as to, to either not spook markets or to – you know, to, to have a, a certain course of action take place. I mean, it's just mind bug. You know, it really is. And to think that everyone's going to sort of, uh, you know, get in this lockstep uh, in line with uh, what they want to do, it's, it's, it's really far-fetched, to be honest with you. So, and anyway, let's see what's going on here. Let's, let's go back to the shorter-term charts because, quite frankly, that's where the action's been. And, okay, there we go. That was the break of 144 that we were just looking at. Um, I guess on the 15, we said the target was, uh, where did we say that? Down around, uh, 143.60 area. So maybe somebody jumped on that one. I'm too busy yapping away today and, uh, instead of, uh, looking at the place trades here. Alright, I'm guessing S&P is lower. 
Sure, there we go. We know about the correlation in S&P. Hitting right on his daily pivot right there. And uh, to be honest with you, this 1167 uh, uh, area has been uh, a little bit of support here for uh, S&P. So that's kind of been the pivot. And when we look at the pivot areas, all right, you just know that there's going to be a lot of volatility around them. So it'll swing up, it'll swing down around the pivot. All right, it's really the uh, support and the resistance areas which act more as, you know, those, I don't want to call them lines in the sand, but more as, uh, you know, those areas where uh, there'll be more of a significant buildup um, in either support or resistance. Because a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we use the pivot itself as support, but a lot of times there can be a lot of activity there as it just sort of oscillates and swings back and forth. So just be careful with that. Uh, yep, Euro did break down the 144. Yeah, we just uh, just looked at that one. Uh, let's see what else. Anything else exciting happening? Let's see, maybe Aussie's selling off. You know, when sometimes when you've, you know, you're looking at these things and you say, all right, well, you know, I, I missed Euro, but what can I what can I look for next? And, you know, sometimes you can say, all right, well, look at, you know, something like the Aussie. The Aussie's uh, uh, got a pretty decent correlation to the Euro, although, you know, these things have been breaking down a little bit, but perhaps you get a better entry if you look for something like the Aussie, which maybe comes in a little bit lower. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of a break right there, 65, we're at 59. You know, to be honest with you, I'm just not just not feeling any of these moves here from a, from a big perspective. Now, one of the things we can look at, which is sometimes fun, and I know some of you guys like this, is this um, scalping program that I've got that I use here. Um, it's, uh, uh, let's go to Euro. Basically what this is, is this is a one minute chart on the Heike and Ashy. All right, and what we have is three Bollinger Band settings. All right, we've got a one standard deviation, a two standard deviation, and a three standard deviation setting. And essentially what we're looking for is the Heike and Ashy to change. All right, usually that's done uh, by what looks like dojis. Now, I just want people, let me expand this a little bit so we can see this a little bit more. Just bear in mind, if you don't know the difference between Heike and Ashy and uh, regular candlesticks, all right, that the, the the bars are a little bit different, and these long wicks here at the bottom do not uh, represent potential support like they might with candlesticks, but actually uh, you'd like to see those when you're in the middle of a bit of a trend here. So, you know, looking at Euro, you can see here we had the doji right up above the uh, the middle band, and as soon as we broke it down, you know, boom, here we go, and we're moving out towards uh, this third standard deviation band. So I think someone's calling for 143.50 on the move here. Um, I've got it at 143, I think 60 on my uh, pivot support. Uh, yep, so we're getting close. Um, I think those are both pretty good target areas to see. But perhaps, um, you know, if we do get down to that level, maybe we'll get a little bit of a snapback. And we'll have to wait and see. You know, again, we're going to wait for that doji looking bar to show us, all right, this may be where we want to uh, to jump out of this and, and perhaps reverse this trend. But you know, when we talk about a trend in, in choppy markets, it's a very short-term trend. <laughs> so we know. So, you know, there really haven't been any real trends of late that we can speak of. All right. And we're just, I'm just pulling out to the 30 minute a little bit here. All right. And we're just looking back and we're saying, all right, one, yeah, 133.50 looks to be about decent support. Let's hit the one hour. All right, so we're coming now down towards the bottom. All right, maybe we get some selling ahead of this thing tomorrow, get a little bit of a push down. All right, and then we can come back in, buy Euro after Bernanke's done, and, and away it goes. All right, maybe in fact he is going to say QE3. You know, I mean, what's this guy going to do? This is like one of the, the most hotly debated and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, watched events that we've seen in some time. I mean, you know, even the FOMC, people weren't as concerned about and everybody was sort of looking ahead to this Jackson Hole deal, you know. And uh, gosh, it's uh, it's amazing, just uh, just wild, wild stuff. All right, so there goes the uh, the euro. I guess obviously we should have hopped on that thing. Man, <laughs> that's a nice little move there. Oh, uh, let's see what else we got. How about Euro Swissy? Euro Swissy, eh, just sitting in there. Perhaps uh, you can get a little bit more short here. If you're having it already, but you know, to be honest with you, I just, I've just been very, very um, particular about my entries. You know, and if I'm not getting entries uh, ahead of resistance, I'm not looking to get short. And if I can't buy it ahead of support, I'm not really looking to get long. You know, so right down here, you're a Swissy. Yeah, 114, whatever this pivot is, 36, followed by the next uh, uh, 
Oh, 114 even. I think I'd probably prefer to be a little bit uh, long down there and not so much right here. I mean, this seems to me to be a little bit of no man's land. And, you know, I hate the no man's land when uh, when we're trading. You know, I like to operate on either the outside of the bands, which, you know, if you look at how it coincides with the way the pivots are set up, um, that's just a better place to be getting into trades. You know, a lot can happen when you're in that no man's land and that coin flip becomes uh, a little bit more random and the odds, uh, uh, you know, are a little bit less in your favor in those situations. So I've been talking a lot here about what's been going on uh, uh, with the news and stuff. Does anybody have anything they want to take a look at? Uh, let's see here. He takes 143.60 for a 50 pip move down from the entry at 144.10. Yeah, that's uh, that's a nice one. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to look at? I mean, to be honest with you, I, I've really sort of thrown aside um, a lot of these, uh, you know, commodity currencies and risk currencies. Um, so I haven't really been looking at, um, you know, these commodity currencies because it's really, you know, just been it's it's, it's dollar driven. So uh, you know, dollars either going up, or dollars either going down, and you know, these things are, are sort of following suit. You know, but the idea behind, uh, you know, if you miss one. Perhaps you can catch the other. That's a pretty decent idea that you know you may want to think about, especially you know if you know what's driving the market, like the dollar has been. So it's been dollar strength, dollar weakness based on you know what markets think are going on. And you know right now we've got some selling here um, in stocks, and the commodity currencies are going down. So essentially we're going into risk off mode, which you know what that sort of makes sense. All right, especially if you're uncertain about what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, this is the kind of thing where if you're a longer-term investor, you know, why, why sit through the volatility? You know, if, if, if you have gains that you want to take, go ahead and take them. If, if you're afraid that, you know, you've got losses that are potentially, uh, you know, going to go even further, you know, maybe it's better to cut the loss. Who knows? I mean, everybody's different, but it's just one of these things where, you know, sometimes you just want to reduce that volatility in the portfolio and try and get away from it. So, you know, haven't been looking much at, at any of these commodity currencies. Dollar CAD, okay. Um, been good trading movement there, okay. Wow, look at that breakdown. That was right at that 910 news too on Buffett. And that's, uh, what's been interesting is that the, uh, the dollar CAD has actually, uh, been pretty highly correlated of late to, uh, S&P. And you now it's tough to see here because the move is opposite. But you can see here that dollar CAD uh, and the S&P have been experiencing a very high correlation of late. So you can see these moves, all right? Maybe if you know what's going on with one, you know what's going on with the other. So that can, uh, you know, can be a way you can use correlations to sort of help yourself out, figure things out. But, you know, the breakdown of this little uh, support area here uh, would have been a nice area to get short. And All right, now we've got dollar strengthening further. Probably going to come back up here, test the top of the range, all right? But... Doesn't look like there's a ton of uh, ton of juice in there, and I'm not certain that I'd want to buy ahead of what looks like uh, this uh, S1 support here because it got broken down pretty easily. So not a lot of uh, not a lot of strength there. All right, does anybody have any questions about anything we've gone over? Anything you want to look at? Any types of uh, uh, different pairs? Any anything? Let's see. Uh, how in the world do I manage to have S&P on market scope? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is a uh, UK account, and this is actually uh, the CFD for S&P. So if, you, um, if you're in the U.S., unfortunately, you don't have access to that, thanks to the good regulators here. But you can also see I can get uh, gold as well as U.S. oil as well. So those are the uh, the CFDs. Let's see, euro is beginning to bounce at 143.60 on the one-minute chart. Let's see. Yep. That was a pretty good area of uh, support there. There's the doji. Okay, we're just coming off of uh, oversold there. All right, maybe there's going to be a quick scalp back here to the middle band, say, up to the uh, 4380 area. So there is sometimes, you know, you can look at this thing. I mean, you know, to be honest with you, it, it, it's hard for me to just sit here on these scalping charts with you and say, all right, let's all buy it. Now it's all set. You know, it, it's just too tough to do. But, you know, if this is something that you like to do and you're more of a uh, – a rapid trader, you know, this is a setup you could potentially look at and, you know, just follow it yourself. And, you know, you want to obviously make sure you've got pairs in here where uh, there's a lot of liquidity, all right, so you can get tighter spreads on it because obviously if you're doing some scalping, all right, you don't want all of that profit to be eaten up by spread. So, you know, you wouldn't fire, say, you know, dollar peso on here or something like that, you know. 
Um, you just want to make sure that you've got tight spreads. But look, this thing could be coming back here, so I uh, just need to be careful with that Fuji. Uh, let's see here. Oh, boy. Okay, so anything else we want to take a peek at here? Well, it looks like dollar's still pushing up here. I don't know that uh, that euro dollar's done here. I think maybe your 13, uh, your 43.50 area is going to come into play there, Fuji. But you can see how these things will come in and they'll just bounce at these little areas where, you know, the uh, the initial support or resistance is. And when you're on a short-term scalp or a short-term trade like that, you know, sometimes it's good to just, you know, take one off there maybe, hang on to the rest and see what happens. But, you know, you can see if we go back over here that this area is, uh, looks to be holding in right there. There's that, there's that pivot support. I actually had it up at 63, but, you know, just say 60 for sake of argument. So... What else do we think? Is anybody, uh, what, what do people think about tomorrow? What's going to happen? I mean, do, do people think we're going to see dollar strength or dollar weakness out of this? I mean, you know, it's hard to, to, you know, guess what Bernanke's going to say, um, exactly. But I think more importantly, as traders, we have to be concerned about what the reaction's going to be. And that's really what it comes down to. So do people think we're going to see dollar strength or dollar weakness? See, someone's, Paul Volker says stocks are going to fall off. You know, Paul, I, I would I would believe in you, man. Uh, you know, you've got some experience in these markets. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Paul Volcker is, you can certainly do a Google. Um, but uh, it's uh, yeah, I think we could see some uh, uh, some market disappointment tomorrow. But you know, stocks tank. What, what does that mean for the rest of the markets? I mean, dollar strengthening. All right, does that mean euros tanking too? It's 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 interesting, you know. Uh, let's see. Fuji says, don't predict, just take it when it comes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we've been talking about, you know? You, you don't want to try and get in ahead of this thing because it could be a, could be a freight train. So, that's definitely, uh, you know, something to take a look at. Maybe the GDP report effect. Yeah, it's possible. Um, gosh, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not certain what the expectations are, but GDP has been ratcheted down for so long here, and these expectations have just been lowered and lowered. It's just amazing that, you know, any of these guys get paid uh, to put out their forecasts to begin with. And, you know, I think one of the things that you have to consider is, is the effect over time is that, you know, based on the current trajectory that the U.S. is on right now, there's just no possible way GDP is going to increase unless something is done to improve confidence. And it's just really, it's just a mathematical equation. You know, if you think about what GDP is, all right, GDP is just a formula, all right? It's, it's, it's uh, uh, personal consumption. All right, plus business investment, plus government spending, plus net exports, which is essentially a country's, you know, exports minus imports, the net effect. All right, and that's all it is. It's really just a mathematical formula. All right, well, we know that consumer spending has been down quite a bit because we have high unemployment, 9.2% officially, or 9.1%, excuse me. All right, but people say it's up in the 15 17% range, actually. All right, we know we have no business investment going on right now. You hear about all the cash sitting on the sidelines of these corporations. Why? All right, everyone's afraid of uh, new health care. What's that going to cost? New regulations. Thanks, Dodd-Frank. All right, you basically drove the economy into the toilet to begin with through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and now you're writing the rules? All right, and lastly, the effect of potentially having higher taxes. All right, let's tax the rich and those corporate jet owners and those who provide jobs to people. Good idea. Tax them. All right, shrink that pie. All right, shrink that pie, but redistribute it more fairly. All right, I, I just don't know what you're thinking about. And net exports, all right, I, I don't know the last time the U.S. had a uh, uh, a trade balance surplus as opposed to a deficit. All right, all the money goes to China, basically, you know, just in the door and right out the other side. China's got a nice currency peg there that they enjoy. It essentially acts as a black hole, just sucks the money out. So Bernanke prints it, all right, and we just shovel it off to China, basically. So... You know, if, if, if nobody's willing to do anything about anything, how, how is any of this going to change? All right? As, as we go over the course of time, all right, the business investment gets less. All right? So they're talking about decreasing government spending now. I mean, government spending has really been the only positive plus that you have. And you know what? Quite frankly, I'd prefer to see declining GDP if government spending went down. You know, let's get business investment up. All right? Business investment. That's going to create jobs. People are going to have jobs. They're going to spend. That's going to get consumption up. Let's, let's have a tough talk with China, see what we need to do over there to try and improve exports. All right, these are all things that you can do. But trying to hold up a, uh, a formula that's got four inputs with just one, which is government spending, 
you know, that, that's, that's, that's a waste of time. And, and these guys are, are basically tanking the economy in the process. So, let's see. Anything else that we want to take a look at? What does anybody, th everybody think here? Nothing, right? Okay. No, there goes Euro. Mm. Well, you know, sometimes it's just not good enough to, to know where the levels are. you got to act on them. And unfortunately, uh, I think I'm too busy pontificating here a day in advance of, uh, of Bernanke. You know, gosh, I, I really hope he just comes out tomorrow and says, God, I had like a really good, you know, cowboy steak last night. And the fly fishing was awesome. And uh, thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> I mean, how great would that be? <laughs> but I don't think we're going to see that happen. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting times. Let's see, actually, more drama going in the world is going to present more opportunity for the FX market. Yeah, it probably will. I mean, if anything, we're going to see that volatility increase. But, you know, the question is, is that are we going to get those range breakouts? And, you know, for short-term guys, you know, this market's great. You know, this, this kind of volatility can be awesome. You're just uh, trading those ranges. But the only thing that really concerns me right now is, is that if we get a breakout in the range one way or the other, whether it be to the upside or the downside, based on something that Bernanke is going to say. So, uh, you know, there could be, uh, uh, you know, some interesting dynamics to Marseille. Oh, in order to do that, we need a private sector, we need Republican House and Senate. Yeah, you know, man, I hate to get into politics with you, George. Looks like you're in uh, Georgia, Virginia, which I guess politics is uh, pretty big down there. Um, you know, it's hard to say, man. You know, th these guys just have... Uh, uh, well, forget it. I'm I'm, I'm exhausted with it. You know what? I'm taking a break from politics this week, thankfully, so I prefer to stay on that break. You know, I'm sure we'll hear all about it next week when these guys get back. You know, they can't wait. They've been they've been you know sitting around sipping uh gin rickies all week. You know, just thinking of that one money punchline they're going to use when they get their chance to get up in front of that camera, and it's going to be awesome. You know. Meanwhile, the people suffer. So, anyway, uh, what time is Bernanke's speech tomorrow? I believe it's at, uh, oh, that's a good question. I think it's 10 a.m. Um, let me check uh, the calendar here. Uh, I think it's 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, where is it? Uh, you know what? I'm not even sure. Oh, let's see here. Uh, yes, 10 a.m. Uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's New York time. So that'll be uh, Bernanke tomorrow. All right, we'll have that GDP report. That's out at 8.30 Eastern time, and we'll see. You know, we just got to see what happens. I mean, again, you know, when you talk about what GDP represents, I mean, you know, everybody says, oh, declining GDP or rising. You know, listen, there's a lot more going on than, than just these numbers. And I feel like these, you know, government people and these, these policymakers just look to target these numbers, and it's kind of like, you know what, I, I, I can, if, if you give me the desired output, all right, I can come up with the inputs to, to make that desired output happen. You know, and it's rather than letting the inputs drive what the output is, the output's driving the inputs. Does that make sense? So, I don't know. I mean, there's just, uh, you know, a lot of uh, 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 broken down stuff going on here. And uh, we're going to see, you know. Maybe Bernanke's got one more trick to pull out of his hat tomorrow. All right, maybe he doesn't. You know, maybe it's time we all have that serious conversation and, uh, and we look. But regardless of what happens, as Fuji said, there's going to be opportunity in this market. And the question is, you know, are you prepared to, to handle it? Can you get in? Can you get out? All right. Do you, uh, you know, use risk management? All of these things. You know what? And these are the type of things that we actually talk about and teach at FXEDU. And, you know, I'm just going to give you a little plug here. I do one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring, all right, for, uh, you know, people that um, are serious about uh, currency trading. So if you guys have any interest in that at all, by all means, uh, you know, hit us up, and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. So, it uh, looks like i got to shut it down here for the day, so I'm going to thank you again for being here. Um, again, it's Mike Common at FXCDU, um, and I'm actually uh, looking to uh, uh, take a page out of the Ed Ponzi playbook. I'm going to uh, start doing these little uh, Twitter things and get the Twitter machine going, so that's going to be interesting. So, uh, you know, take an eye, uh, keep an eye out there for me. Uh, you know, if you're someone who's on Twitter following people, I'd love to have you. So thanks again, guys, and uh, good luck tomorrow. Be careful, uh, and good trading to all. So long.